two, one, two, one, two, testing, one, two, one, two, testing. Good evening, church. As we all begin to find our seats, we're going to begin this evening service with a song, Can't Stop Praising His Name. Let's sing it every day. song bless the lord
Praise your life, our God is able in his name. We overcome for the Lord, our God is able. Oh, hallelujah, church. As we slow things down, we're going to sing this song. Your 
God praise together right now. Hallelujah. Shando rodo lo boko sera la mando rebe ki asaya. Shi ala mando rodo lo boko riaranda la masiko rebe ki aranda. Jesus, tonight we do exalt your name. We give you praise, Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Shando rodo lo boko rebe kirio lo boko sea. Shanda rara la mando rodo lo boko rebe kirio lo bose. Wonderful is your name, Jesus. Wonderful is your name. Amen. Praise the Lord. We want to open our service tonight in prayer. We want to pray that God would pour out his spirit upon our nation, upon our churches, um, and God will give us revival. Um, we want to pray for our spiritual leaders, Pastor Greg, uh, Mitchell, the Prescott staff, lifting up Pastor Heimberg together with the Alorado Park staff, that God's hand uh, of grace will be upon our leaders tonight. Um, let's pray for this pioneer rally. That God is going to speak to us. God's going to give us clear direction. I want to pray that God would raise up workers in this rally. That God would raise up preachers for the gospel as well. If you've got a need of your own with an uplifted hand, you can make that need known tonight. We're going to lift our voices together as one. We're going to cry out to God. And when we subside, Pastor Sean Stellenberg is going to come and open us in prayer. Let's begin to pray together. Father God. I am asking you tonight, Lord God, that you would breed upon this service. God, I pray, let there be a quickening of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, tonight that you would anoint the preaching of your word. Cause, oh God, that to be revelation and clarity. 
Father God, I'm asking, let there be an impartation of spirit and of heart tonight. I'm asking God, you would unify us. Oh God, we need you in this rally, Lord God, that you are going to work wonderful miracles. For you tonight, oh God, Lord, with open hearts tonight, oh God. Lord, I pray tonight that you pour your spirit upon this place tonight. Lord, almighty God, surround us with your Holy Spirit. Have right of way in the service tonight, oh God. Speak tonight, oh God. As we open up our hearts tonight, oh God. Lord, we bring our spiritual leaders before you tonight. Anoint them, touch them, oh God. Lord, we pray for your servant tonight who will minister. Minister God, Lord, touch the service tonight, oh God. We pray for tomorrow, God. Lord, that we will not leave here like we have come, oh God. Lord, that we will leave here change and transform, almighty God. Have right of way in the hearts of your people, oh God. Anoint the service in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated tonight. I do want to take this time and I want to welcome you tonight on behalf of, of the Alorado Park Church staff and the congregation. Welcome to this Pioneer Rally. We are so glad that you took the time to make the investment tonight. Every pastor, every church, we do appreciate you for coming out and being a part of this rally together with us. And so just a couple of announcements that I do want to bring to your attention. We will be having uh, on the 6th of May our next uh, men's discipleship. Uh, so please, if you would take note of that, then uh, looking ahead in June the 28th and the 29th, we will be having our national uh, men's rally. Uh, the guest speaker for that will be Pastor Daryl Elliott from Australia. We're going to have a great time together with him. Uh, if you could diarize that and begin to plan towards being here together with your men, that will be really appreciated. Uh, then for all of the pastors that are here, we just wanted you to take note that tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock in classroom 1 upstairs, uh, Pastor Heimbuck will be doing a question and answer. There will be coffee. If you could come a little bit earlier, just grab a cup of coffee, have a little bit of fellowship. But at 7 o'clock, um, it's going to be questions and answers. Uh, that is only for the pastors. Um, so please just take note of that. It's a little bit early, but you come. We're going to have a great time. Half past 7 we will have prayer up until half past eight. We need God in this rally. We need God to speak to us. So we encourage you to come together, meet with us. The prayer room in the back will be used. And so you can be a part of that prayer, lay a hold of God to speak to us through the seminars tomorrow morning. We are having a great lineup in that. We're going to have Pastor Isaac Matabula, Pastor Shannon Yerkske, and Pastor Francis Muntumosi tomorrow morning. It is going to be an incredible time in the word of God with these men that will be preaching the gospel to you and I. Amen. So right now we are going to hear uh, some reports of what God is doing in our nation. Um, and in three minutes or less, um, the following pastors are going to come. They're going to tell us their name, their wife's name, the city they labor in, what God has been doing um, in their church. They're going to come in this order. Pastor Koketso Mboweni, Pastor Fabian Estherson, Pastor Alfred Mzwana, and then uh, Pastor Ashton Tierflayer. Let's give uh, Pastor Koketso a hand as he comes. Praise God, amen. Thank you. My name is Koketso, and my beautiful wife, Bronwyn, my son, Ruri, and daughter, Shiloh, we were sent out, out of the 2022 conference uh, to the beautiful amen, township of Haranku in the Pretoria North. And we started the same year, December 2022. We just full on went in. Uh, we found the school to start the work of God. Uh, just, it's just been a year and a half now, and God has really been helping us. Our first service, God helped us. We thank you, amen. We managed to have a couple of people coming in in that first service. In that week also, we had two families that were coming. And I went to them, this is what is amazing, and I asked them, how did you know about this church? We invited you. So they told me that the Sunday when the, our first service started, just the Saturday, there was a parents meeting. 
and the principal whom I never witnessed to or told anything about our church, she told all the parents that came into that meeting to say that tomorrow Sunday there's a church that is starting. And if you want to get saved, you must come to that church. So they came in, that couple, amen, and they started to lock in and said, you know what, we believe in God, that God has called us into that place for that moment. And they've been laboring with us and more families has been coming in and God has been helping us. Just some of the highlights, just four months after that, March 23, we had a revival with our evangelist, Mike Brill. He came in. We had many visitors coming in, getting saved, miracle healing. And even the church, I mean, as we were starting, they were getting encouraged just from that revival. Our second revival, it is when we are having our one-year anniversary in December with our very own pastor, amen, Pastor Francis. He came, amen, and did a powerful revival for us where hope was restored, encouragement, and there was a lot of healing, and the church was just uh, encouraged from that. And every month, just from this year, we've been having growth, new people coming in, young people rising up, wanting to do something for God, amen. And just uh, March last month, we just had three souls that got baptized. They said, you know what, I am tired of the world, and I want to commit myself to Jesus Christ. We started new believers classes, and young, and the church, we I got two instruments, we're learning instruments, we said, you know what, we want to be done with mini disc and we want to form a band. Amen. <laughs> uh, just last month, we just had our first uh, men's class. Young men, all men coming in with a desire to serve God. And this is what God has called us for. In our first class, we had seven men that came that morning. Amen. And they said that we want to be disciples. We want to know how God can be able to use our life. God is using us a lot in that area of Rangua. Uh, souls are just getting saved amen just one more miracle we had one brother who came into our church and he said pastor i cannot sleep you know i have to sleep with a light on and i just have to uh you know i struggle if i switch off the light there are things that is attacking me at night i said brother you are saved now all that you have to do now it is to read your bible come to church and pray the next week he came back and he says pastor i'm, pastor, I'm sleeping nice now I'm switching off the light, amen. I say praise be to God, amen. I just want to thank, amen, every impact team that came, amen. Each and every one of you, you really did an impact in Ranku, amen. All the way, amen, traveling to us, so I appreciate that. I want to appreciate, amen, the most important person, my wife, amen. Such a brave woman, amen. All the way from Cape Town with me to Pretoria, amen, to the township of Ranku, amen, winning the loss for Jesus. My pastor, amen, sister, I want to thank them for the relationship, helping us, directing us, amen, and always available. The Sunnyside Church, I love you so much, amen. And just the Rankua Church, amen, right here, amen. We came with over 20 people, amen. We love you so much. Jesus loves you, amen. Pray for us. And my name is Fabian, my wife Rochelle and our three kids. Uh, we took over the Bloemfontein Church in 2017 uh, from Pastor David Kennedy and Sister Louise from the UK. Uh, just this last year, uh, we have four powerful revivals with the following pastors. Pastor Eric Roberts uh, with the Impact Team from UK. Uh, Pastor Michael Brick, uh, Evangelist uh, Patrick Johnson, Pastor Naaman Strack. And also, and also last week we had Pastor David Kennedy also with an impact team, amen. This was so profound because we could see the difference in our church, amen. We always had about 70s, in the 70s, amen, people coming. But after this revivals, we saw 120 people coming faithfully uh, to our church. November last year, amen, we had a, a baptism and nine souls were baptized, amen, in our church. Uh, in March, in March this year, amen, we had 11 kids uh, being uh, um, dedicated, amen. That shows that our church is also growing within, amen. Uh, so, so that's a good thing, amen. Last year, we sowed uh, Pastor Heinberg's uh, Bible series from year to I do, 
And just this year, we had two couples already saying, I do. Amen. So that's good. Another one is going to say, I do in June. Amen. So we thank God for that. Amen. For all that God is doing. One of our brothers in our church, amen, his sister, uh, lost sight in a one eye and he asked, Pastor, if you can come with me to the hospital. I went with our brother to the hospital. We prayed for our sister. She couldn't see. The doctors couldn't uh, find out what's wrong with her one eye. And as I laid hands on her eye, amen, I believed God for the supernatural. And God touched that sister that next Sunday she was in church and she testified that Jesus Christ healed her and she can see again. Amen. This evening, I just want to thank my wife, amen, for supporting me all the years in the ministry. I also want to thank Pastor Heinberg for his leadership, amen, and always being available. God bless. Amen. My name is Alfred, and uh, my loving wife is with me here, Phyllis. And our daughter, Evelyn, uh, we were sent from the conference board in 2023, that is last year. And uh, we are sent from the Kimberley Church into the Lerato Park, Rudapan, uh, in Kimberley. <laughs> Just when we got back home, we started door-to-door, -door, uh, you know, um, outreaches. And um, out of that, there was a family that uh, we, we met and... No, they surrendered their lives uh, to the Lord, and since that time, they have locked in into the church, and as well, this time, their son, their son is also saved and is uh, with us uh, tonight. We trusted God uh, that though we didn't have a building, we decided to go ahead with my pastor, we talked to the municipality and they gave us favor to begin to have services in a car park of one of the housing uh, complex. And uh, before our first service, uh, we did a movie. And uh, during that movie, uh, a, a number of families came forth and, you know, rededicated their lives to the Lord. And uh, up to this time, they are still in the church. And uh, a mother and the son, they are in the building uh, tonight. And just a day before we launched our first service, uh, we had, um, you know, an outreach, an open-air outreach. And during that time, two young men came in, and they were powerfully saved. And they told me that, Pastor, we have heard that you are up, starting up a church tomorrow. We are going to be there. And I tested them, them. I said, okay, I need, uh, you know, um, bags of debt to hold our, you know, our gazebos. And the following morning, I was surprised. No, they had, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 bags of sand. And from that time, they are with us. And tonight, they are in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Two young brothers, quite young. Uh, they locked in in the church right from the beginning. And during uh, one of our outreaches, their mother came in. She was powerfully saved. Uh, the aunt also came in, she was saved, and both those two boys and their aunt, they are with us uh, tonight. We are continuing to trust God and to push uh, forward, forth. This time, uh, we now have a tent. Uh, the Mother Church has gifted us with a tent. And right from the first service, uh, we saw 53, you know, uh, in attendance. And they, uh, up to now, we have about 30 to about 69, you know, in the services. And all that, we want to give the God uh, the glory and uh, the praise. We have seen, we have seen uh, a number of disciples lock in, young men, old men, wanting to do the will of the Lord. And our outreaches now, you know, are very, very powerful because we have um, a big team and we are able to make impact in Rattle Park. I want to thank uh, the leadership church here, Pastor Heinberg, as well as uh, my pastor, Pastor Neman and Sister Dawn, as well as my loving wife, and also most of all, I want to give God the glory for the Rato Church. Church Rato Church, are you here? Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
So pray for us as we pray for you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, warm welcome. Uh, my, my name is Ashton. Me and my beautiful wife. Hey, I'm only five months old, man. <laughs> I'm still a baby. Me and my wife, uh, beautiful wife, um, Daniil, we were launched out, out of the El Dorado Park um, during the 2023 Bible Conference in Tulanesia, a city known for the vibrant culture and Priyani. Amen. There's wife. <laughs> Guess where I fell in love with Briani and Popper. <laughs> Within two months, we secured a building. Uh, our first service was in November 26 in the building. In December, we were blessed to have our very first revival with evangelist Mike Bro. The Saturday before the revival, we had our very first uh, music outreach in the park, which resulted into 30 decisions made for Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> And one notable healing. The first service in the morning, we had 22 in attendance, 23 in the evening, 30 on Monday night, 48 on Tuesday, and 28 on the final night of revival. Amen. <clears throat> the total impact of that revival was very profound with over 48 decisions made for Jesus with four notable healings and nine baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen. In January, we had a special service with Pastor Walid Ling, uh, where words of knowledge were imparted into, uh, were given um, to our church, um, words of knowledge were given to the folks. Uh, one couple came, a new couple came to the church. God spoken to both of them. They are here tonight. Amen. Out of that, we saw eight new conversions and one notable healing, and we had 36 in attendance for that special service. Amen. In February, we participated in the annual marriage a seminar, which was hosted by the Elder Church with Pastor Scott Lamb. Our church was able to accommodate three couples, which further enriched and strengthened their marriages. Amen. In our congregation. March was marked by a very significant milestone for us as a church. On one of the outreach occasions, a lady was deaf in one ear, managed to pray for, believe Jesus, and she was supernaturally healed. Amen. <laughs> during the month, during the month one, of, one of the services, um, I did not feel okay within one of our services. The next week, I preached on witchcraft. We had 13 in attendance, five saved, one notable healing. A lady came, she had pain in the back set her down on the chair as i began to pray for the legs start growing out amen <laughs> praise god in the evening service we had three filled with the holy ghost and two refilled with the holy ghost amen <laughs> we also had our very first baptism baptism service and we were able to baptize four individuals that day and two salvations for jesus christ During our Easter celebration on Friday, uh, 180 night, we presented the movie, The Passion of the Christ. We had 40 in attendance, five decisions made for Jesus Christ, and one notable healing. Amen. <laughs> on Sunday morning, the Easter service, we had 50 in attendance and three decisions made for Jesus Christ. In April, the winter men's discipleship, we were able to bring nine men to the men's discipleship class. Amen. One key highlight for our church is during one Tuesday outreach, we encountered a man with whom I prayed a sinner's prayer, leading to a transformative encounter with Jesus. He's currently enrolled in the Choose to Change program um, in El Dorado Park where God is helping him. He's excited to be here today. Um, today exactly marks one month since Sudeshan has joined the program. Amen. <clears throat> with the, the recent revival with Pastor Success, Adashida, um, Sudeshan got filled with the Holy Ghost. In closing, I just want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the El Dorado Park Church for your unwavering support and investment into the Lanesha Church. I deeply am grateful um, to my pastor, his wife, for his leadership and gui uh, guidance, Sister Rachel, as well as my beloved wife, my daughter, my son, for their unwavering support and love, and to the Lanesha Church. We love you, and thank you for your presence and commitment. You inspire, you inspire us to take Lanesha for Jesus. Amen.
Amen. These are wonderful reports. Can you say amen? What God is doing is amazing. And what God is doing also costs some money. Now, I don't love money, but I do love to take up offerings. The reason I do this and love this is because I'm confident tonight that as we give into God's kingdom, that God will bless us. Because I've seen it through my life. I've seen it as a pastor. I've seen it in the people of our church. That God blesses us as we take care of his kingdom needs. One skeptic said to a preacher, I can't stand this Christian business. All I ever hear from Christians is give, give, give. The preacher thought a minute and said, that's about the best description I have ever heard of a Christian. Christians give. We know to give. And the reason why we give is because we know tonight that God is a blesser of those that gives. You know, tonight I want you to forget about all the offerings that you have given in the past. Three tonight as the first offering. The first offering when you got your job and you couldn't wait to give your tithe. Remember that? You got that new job or you got that promotion or you got that first time that you could give your tithe and your offerings. See, one of my disciples came to me two weeks ago with a testimony. He said, I decided to give more than my tithe. And he gave, about, he gave his tithe and then three times more than his tithe. And he said that same night, somebody phoned him with extra work. He's a, he does tutoring to make extra money. And he told me tonight also, I asked him, I just want to fact straight. And he says, yes, someone else also phoned me for an, an, an extra tutoring uh, job. So he's making, God is, God is blessing this. And God is making him see that if you are going to believe God in miracle money, that God is going to respond with miracles. And as I was praying about this offering, the Holy Spirit dropped something in my heart that a few years ago I was worried. You know, you worry sometimes as a pastor, I was worried, you know, about the church, the finances, the things that we have to pay. And I asked the Holy, Holy Spirit, you know, what should we be worried about? And God, God brought me to the scripture in Matthew 6, 25, where it says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor what your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not, he not much more clothe you, or you of little faith? Now in the scripture, Jesus is asking five questions. The first question is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Second question he asks is, are you not of more value than they? The third question is, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Fourth question, he says, so why are you worried about clothing? And then the fifth question is, will he not clothe you, or you of little faith? Now Jesus addresses the five questions. Or actually, he's addressing the five things that we worry about when offerings are taken out. Offerings that, is, that we take up because we have a vision to reach this world for Jesus. Because we have a vision to plant, this, plant churches and we have a world vision to plant churches all over the world. The first thing that we think about when offerings are taken up is food and clothing. What I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear. Second thing we think about is the future, our value. Will God take care of our future? Third thing is our stature, our status, our reputation or importance. The fourth thing that comes to our mind is clothing, yes. So it seems like clothing comes up a lot. What am I going to wear? What am I going to drink? How is God going to take care of it? That's the fifth thing is the providence of God, the supernatural providence of God. That's challenged every time an offering is taken up. Because we worry about these things. But Jesus said, he answers the question again. From verse 31, he starts answering these five questions. Verse 31, he says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek. 
For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow worry about His own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So He says to us, first of all, to answer the first question, do not worry about life. Do not worry about what you're going to eat, drink, or wear when the offering is being taken up, right? Because your heavenly Father knows what you need. Second thing he answers, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, all these things, the things in life. Your Father is looking down, he sees you, he sees your needs, he knows your needs. So we don't need to worry about it, and he also knows our needs. The third thing is you're not like an unbeliever anymore who does not understand the value of giving into God's kingdom. Those are the things Gentiles seek, Jesus said. But we are not like Gentiles. We are saved. We are born again. And we understand the kingdom dynamics. We understand kingdom finances. We understand if we are going to supernaturally give, God is going to supernaturally respond to our giving. This is what my disciple in the church saw. He says, I'm going to step out. I'm going to believe God. He did that. And God responded by giving him back. We are not unbelievers. We are sons and daughters of God. The fourth thing that God answers is He will provide your everyday need. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for to tomorrow will worry about its own things. When it comes to giving, we worry about tomorrow. Jesus says we shouldn't worry about all these things. And you can say, you know, this is what we need to worry about is the, is the kingdom things. Do not worry about the future, but place your future in the hands of God. Place Believe God with your calling. Believe Him with your purpose. The fifth answer here is the greatest solution. And this is where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now, this is what I believe makes us what we are as a fellowship. We believe in the supernatural supply of God. You know, as I was as I was asking God about worries and so on, he pointed me to the scripture. I said, God, what should I be worried about? God, is, God said to me, don't worry about anything but the kingdom of God. Because if we are constantly going to be worried about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, about our future, our status, and all of these things that he mentions here, all these five things, uh, we are not going to give. We are not going to believe God with, uh, with money. We're not going to give supernaturally. And this is why we need to be worried about the kingdom of God, about giving to His kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom. See, when we leave these things and we, these other things, these other worries to God, that means we can focus our attention on our vision. We can focus our money the attention of our money we can give because we believe in evangelism we believe in making disciples we believe in sending out churches tonight we believe in world evangelism so the simple answer is what should you be worried about and that's the kingdom needs I take it upon myself also to take responsibility we what we like to try and give us more and more into uh, the, the world evangelism account we try to every six months up it make it more that's my own challenge my own challenge is every six months i want to be giving more to world evangelism every six months i want to up my giving now this is not just true for for the individual towards the church but this is also true for us as pastors towards the Eldorado park church that we want to partner together we take responsibility we say the kingdom first yes my church has needs I'm going to worry about my church, what we're going to eat, drink, and wear in my church. But I'm going to leave that to God, and I'm also going to believe God to give as a pastor from the church. Mark Olson always says, he has this saying, if God can get money through you, he'll get money to you. I want to tell you that is very true. We have a guy in our church, it was always his mission to give towards the church to make sure that we are taken care of as a as a pastor's couple to do what needs to be done 
so that we would have enough that church have enough he always gave supernaturally he's always concerned if he would ask he would ask me do you have enough pastor? do you have enough to live to eat you know and, and this is not a question everybody asked you know so it was his mission to make sure that we have enough but then he had an event in his life a few years ago that he almost died and this shook, shook his life this shook his confidence this shook his faith he lived to give but now it seems like something has changed and he lives to keep it he lives to keep as much as he can he's now living in a different way people used to look at him and think to themselves man how is it where does your business come from where do you get all you know people were amazed at the supernatural anointing and business in his business in 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 uh, out of the blue he would get orders and and this was supernatural because it was always his mission to give as much as he could to the kingdom of god but now people are amazed at the lack of business people are amazed at the change that has come because his mission in life has changed that mission to give that mission to make sure that the kingdom is taken care of because there's a, a wonderful promise here that jesus made by saying seek ye first the kingdom and righteousness and the rest shall be added unto you shall we do that tonight can we forget about all those cares and worries like jesus says do not worry about life let's worry tonight about giving to the kingdom and let's open our hearts so that God can challenge you that God can put on you the amount you can give as pastors as well that God can put an amount on you that you might be able to give from your church that you will say God I want to stretch myself I want to see miracle resources miracle money coming into my life and God will respond to that because he always does he responds to faith he responds to giving we will believe him tonight Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in closing giving is not God's way of raising money it's God's way of raising children let's be his children tonight that believes that he is our provider and that he is going to help us to continue our mission here on earth can you say amen let's bow our heads as the ushers come tonight amen Jonathan would you pray for us Amen. Church, as we eat, we're going to sing that song, God is Able. Let's see, God is Able. God is Able. He will never fail. He's Almighty God. Better than all we see. Better than all we have. As the great things lifted up, defeated the grave, praise the life of God is able in His name. We overcome for the Lord our God is sick. God is able, God is able, He will never fail. He is Almighty God. Better than all we see, better than all we ask. He has done great things, lifted up, defeated a grave, raised to life. Our God is able in His name. We overcome for the Lord. I let's sing it out, lifted up, lifted up. Feet of the grave, raise your life, our God is able, in His name, we overcome, for the Lord, let's sing it one more time, we lift it up, lift it up, defeat of the grave, raise your life, our God is able, in His name, we overcome, for the Lord our God is there. Amen. Thank
Thank you, musicians and workers. We appreciate your ministry. I want to add my welcome to everyone that's here uh, tonight. Thank you for joining with us in our annual Pioneer Rally. How many of you are glad to be here tonight? Amen. God is going to help us this weekend. Really looking forward to tomorrow and what God's going to do. I have the privilege of being able to travel around our fellowship in Southern Africa, the rallies, men's discipleships, and I get to see what God is doing. Listen, what God is doing in our fellowship in Southern Africa is amazing. Everywhere I go, I see churches growing, disciples being raised up. God is really helping us, and uh, God has been helping us here in El Dorado Park. The church here has been thriving. I hope this weekend, you take back some of what we have here into your church. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. Joshua 22, if you'll turn there with me. Joshua 22. There are two events in my early ministry that really shaped my uh, understanding of our fellowship and what it means to do what we do when we first went into the ministry we went to las vegas nevada we're from prescott arizona prescott it's not like here it's a small town so if you get sent out you have to leave town you know joe works kind of cool like you can send you out you don't even have to move sometimes right when you get sent out from prescott it's like go away farther no farther right the slogan is how can we miss you if you won't go away right so we were, we were like four hours away from our mother church. And so the two, the, these two events, the first was the first time the Prescott Church sent an impact team for us. And we're four hours away. They came. They sent a bunch of people that outreached for us all day, did a concert for us. And I have to say... Maybe it's my own uh, inferiority complex or rejection issues. I don't know. But when they pulled up, I was like, oh, they came. <laughs> they still love me. And it was like that my mother church would invest in me. It just, it, it, to this day, I still remember. I still remember many of the people that were on that impact team, the band that played, the concert that night, because it made such an impact on me. But what I wasn't really expecting was there was another impact team. I don't know, it would have been some months later, maybe four or five months. And I asked one of the local churches in Las Vegas, Pastor Lamb was there at the time, I asked his church to send an impact team. And they sent over like 80 people. They were there all day, they outreached from morning until night, then they were in the concert with us that night. You know the thing about that is they didn't know me. Right, I'm from Prescott. You know, it makes sense for them to send a team. But these people, we had only been in Las Vegas a few months. Most of them had never even met me. They've never heard me preach. They know nothing about me. And yet they came and did an impact team for us. I'm going to tell you, it was that day I remember thinking, this is what the fellowship is. Now I get it. We're not just people uh, scattered around, but we really are fellows that are working together. Listen, we cannot ever forget the incredible need for and the power of partnership in our fellowship. I want to preach a message this evening called Gospel Partners. Joshua 22, I want to read beginning in verse 1. It says, Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, half the tribe of Manasseh. And he said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren all these days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents in the land of your possession, which Moses has given you on the other side of the Jordan. But take careful heed to, do the, command, uh, to the commandment uh, and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, 
to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, hold fast to him, serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now, to half the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but the other half, Joshua gave a possession among their brethren on this side of the Jordan, westward. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, Return with much riches to your tents, with very much livestock, with silver, with gold and bronze, iron, and very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. Verse 9, So the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had obtained according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Gospel uh, partners, let's talk first for a moment about misunderstanding partnership. There are some mistaken ideas about ministry and partnership. Some are just wrong ideas about ministry itself, but sometimes people have wrong ideas that really get to the core issue of fellowship and partnership. Some people have a mistaken idea of freedom. In other words, there are people that they really believe when they finally get sent out that this is Freedom Day. It's Emancipation Day. Oh man, pastor sent me out, now I'm on my own. I don't have to listen to that old man tell me what to do. I know that, I'm just, I know that doesn't happen in South Africa, but I'm just preaching this for anyone that might watch online, you know. Yeah, I've had all these great ideas, but pastor doesn't, but now in my, I've got some ideas. So some people, they really view, that's their idea of getting sent out, is they can do their own thing now. And we don't have to be like the fellowship. On the other hand, some people have this weird perspective of loneliness in the ministry. You ever talk to people in the ministry, and every time you talk to them, you feel like you're reading a brand new edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs? How are you, brother? Oh, just fighting for the kingdom. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it. I mean, you got electric lights and running water. You're fighting. Okay, maybe not the electric lights part in South Africa, but you know. <laughs> but this this weird idea. I'm all by myself. I'm doing this on my... I've got the hardest city, right? You're dying for the gospel out there. Some people view their struggle and their loneliness almost spiritually. The worse it is for you, the more spiritual you feel. But this is not accurate because these mindsets will have a practical effect on your ministry. At the most basic, these are mindsets that will not cultivate a spirit of partnership. If you are relishing your freedom or you're sulking in your loneliness, you will not actually engage in partnership with your brothers and sisters around you. Fellowship partnership becomes transactional. Maybe you've had conversations like this. A guy calls you up. Hey, brother, listen, I need an impact team. Remember, I sent you one last year. We're not trading. What's happening here, right? Or maybe you've been the guy. Hey, remember when we sent you a music group? I'm calling in my favor. But... You're misunderstanding something. That's not, that's not how a relationship works. It's not a transaction. You don't pay your children to love you. There's no transaction involved here. Sometimes we can allow shame and embarrassment to isolate us. Interesting to me as a pastor, especially in a larger church, is how you never get calls for impact teams from struggling pastors. The guy that has nobody, he never calls for an impact team. The guy who's got something going on, he'll call. Why is it that if you have nothing, you won't ask for help? Isn't that when you should be asking for help the most often? That's when you need it the most. But we allow, because we've adopted either the idea of freedom or loneliness, we've allowed shame to take over, and now you're afraid to ask your mother church or any other church to send you help because you're afraid they're going to see what's not happening. 
And so the result is, there are pastors, here we are in this incredible fellowship. And what God is doing in our midst is mind-boggling. And yet there are pastors who are functionally alone. You're in a city like this with dozens of pastors around you and you're alone. You have no real meaningful interaction between your congregations. But what's more frightening is that these ideas will affect the fellowship as a whole. Our scripture is the end of the story when it all went well. But at the beginning, Moses actually warned the two and a half tribes. Numbers 32, 6 and 7. Moses said to the children of Gad and Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Listen to what he says. Now, why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going into the land God promised them? He understood something, and he understood that that spirit of loneliness, that spirit of independence, it would be an infection in the larger body. Even those that didn't feel that way, this spirit would begin to corrupt the mindsets of other people. He says, why will you discourage the hearts of other people? If you won't ask for help, if you won't send help, that actually will affect other people. But listen, this is practical. When men isolate themselves in the functional needs of ministry, for example, impact teams or partnership together, it is going to affect all of us. None of us is an island. If we allow this spirit to take root, it will affect every single one of us. Right, it's very practical. On one hand, churches just won't grow like they need to. Pastor, have you figured this out yet? You can't do it. No, I, I, can, I can feel it. You can't. I know when we all went out to Pioneer, we thought we could do it. I mean, we had dreams. We went out, man, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the baddest, right? Pastor Mitchell's gonna call me for advice after I Pioneer. Every one of you thought it. <laughs> of course, you were wise enough to not say it out loud, but then you got out there and you were like, I need help. But if you don't ask for help, your church will not, it, it will not, it cannot grow the way God wants it to. If you've got a good church, a thriving church, help will make it grow faster. So here's the very practical reality. If we lose the idea of impact teams, we are not going to grow into the dynamic that God has laid before us. Then logically, this will create other problems, things that I have observed over time. When there is a church planter, someone who's sending churches out, if he sends pioneers out, but then his pioneer can't get help from other churches, he realizes, I'm going to have to help my pioneers. And so because he's only helping his pioneers and not helping other people because no one else is getting involved, there's a natural consequence. That spirit bleeds out and we become narrow-minded. I've had people actually ask me the question, Pastor, is it okay to do an impact team for a church, but they're not from the same mother church? Because there are people that genuinely believe that we're supposed to keep it all in the family. And that comes from somewhere. It's a spirit that can infect, and, it, and it's not even intentional. It just happens by default. This is a self-feeding downward, downward spiral. We need a quick history lesson. Now, Pastor, I hope that you have watched at least, or hopefully shown the, the uh, series, Pastor Greg taught the memorial stones. If not, you need to, at the very least, you need to watch it for yourself. But you have to remember how we got here. A lot of people have this idea that one day Pastor Mitchell had this vision, all right, I'm gonna make disciples and plant churches. But that's not how it happened. There was a natural progression. And you know what came first? Impact teams. Of course, back then we called them guerrilla teams because it sounded more aggressive, right? Now they're just impact teams, right? 
But essentially what happened is they were having revival in the Prescott Church. There were young people starting bands. The music ministry was thriving. And he thought, you know what? Other churches need this. So they would shut down everything for the weekend. No concert, no outreach. Take everybody to another city and do an outreach there. All these people would get saved. But what happened was, is they would all get saved, but the religious churches wouldn't take them in because they were all radical converts. They were hippies. And then Pastor Mitchell thought, what we need to do is send our own men there to build a church. Listen, the impact team came first. This is the absolute lifeblood of our fellowship that we are sending impact teams. This is not an accidental thing or something we put on the calendar if nothing else is going on. This is a core central tenet of who we are as a fellowship. One way of looking at it is you could argue that the only reason we have church planting is because we first had impact teams. I know this for a fact. The only reason that there's anyone in this building, the only reason this building exists is because in 1970, there was a man that started sending impact teams. And I'm telling you, that is the absolute foundational uh, uh, stepping block of church planting. And don't forget, these were not one or two hour outreaches, right? An impact team makes impact when we send impact teams they go the idea is that they go all day they should be there all day laboring all day until the event that night whatever that event may be it's not just sending two people while you keep some back to outreach in your city the point is is from the very beginning we're shutting down everything's canceled we're taking everybody to another place to labor and help them so let's talk then about fighting for partnership because the imagery used in our text is fighting for your brethren. Numbers 32, 17 and 18 says, we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the children of Israel until we've brought them to their place. We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. Listen to what they're saying. They said, we will not rest until our brothers receive their inheritance. Did you hear that tonight? We will not rest until our brothers receive their inheritance. That's very different from the way we normally look at things. We normally say, we will not rest until we have received our inheritance. I'm going to fight until my church is big. I'm going to fight until I've got a good ministry. But that's not how it works. They say we're going to fight until our brothers get what God promised them. We're going to fight until their church is thriving. We're going to fight until the will of God is done in that place. Again, our fellowship exists because in 1970, Pastor Mitchell said other churches need what we've got. We need to share what God is doing here in other words it was caring more for what God was doing in another man's church than what God was doing in our own church listen every pastor every disciple every congregation ought to be willing to put the same effort into laboring for another church as you would for your own go and fight for their outreach go and fight for their concert go fight for their revival labor to help them give yourselves for the benefit of the other churches and in our scripture it's a very interesting phrase it says until they receive their inheritance well here's a pop quiz for you what is our inheritance if we want to take the ultimate the medic physical it's heaven isn't it so what is the message we are going to fight for our brethren until Jesus comes back. There's never a point. Listen, I don't care how big your church is. I'm never going to stop sending you an impact team. Because there's no point in which you go, okay, nope, they have arrived. They don't need help any longer. No, my calling as a pastor is that I would send and give help until Jesus comes back. Because that is what it means to be a fellowship. So what this implies then is that there is a cost involved. 
In our scripture, you cannot escape this. It cost these men dearly to fight for their brethren. In uh, uh, the scripture, Numbers 32, 16, and 17 gives us some clarity. Of course, we are not talking about neglecting your own church to go on impact team. Listen, if you call me one day and say, Pastor, I'm sorry, there's nobody in church. I can't pay the rent and my wife hates me. Why is that? Well, because we don't outreach anymore. All I do is impact teams. Okay, you're going to be in trouble if you ever give me that phone call. Because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about neglecting your own business. But read, or listen to Numbers 32, 16, and 17. They said, we will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will go armed before the children of Israel until we brought them to their place. Listen, I have a firm conviction that we must invest. It doesn't matter the size of your church. We must be willing to sacrifice some of what we do in the local church for the sake of another church. Even if you have to cancel what's going on in your church so that you can invest in another church. Listen, the one thing that I don't understand is when people say they're sending an impact team, but what they actually do is they send two crazy people <laughs> and they keep everybody back at home. You know how it is on Saturday? Everyone meets for outreach. There's the one guy, he's like, hey, pastor. You're like, hey, you, you know what? My brother uh, in Eden Park was calling for an impact team. You go to him. All of you guys stay here. We'll have a good outreach at home. That's not righteous. The announcement should sound like this. Church on Saturday, outreach is canceled. We're going to go help our brother. Right? We don't just send a token investment. We make it count. We make it matter. When I was working on this sermon, I was talking with Pastor Lamb. His first church was in Cortez, Colorado. Similarly, very isolated, not nearby uh, any other churches. And so he said once a month, they would shut everything down and take everybody out of town. Sometimes they'd drive many hours do an outreach, have a concert that night, drive home late at night. And he said almost every time he did that, when he got home, he would find new people in his church because God honors that. So my point is this. I am not saying that we should neglect our responsibilities to go labor for another church. Not at all. What I'm saying is it's part of your responsibility to go labor for another church. If you're not doing impact teams on a regular basis, you are shirking part of your responsibility as a pastor, especially as a pastor in our fellowship. That is what it means to be who we are and to do, who we, uh, and to do what we do. How can we claim to be a fellowship when we have so little involvement with our fellows? Now, I want to throw this out there right now. This is a, just a little pressure relief valve. Because no doubt, as I'm preaching right now, there's probably someone in here, maybe a couple of you, they're going, thank God, Pastor Humber, you tell them about it. Because every time I call for it, I get it. No, 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 no. There is also a burden on you if you're asking for help. You need to actually have an outreach happening. I have gone on impact teams and showed up at the church. And you get to the church and you're like, you finally called the pastor. Oh, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, making flyers right now. <laughs> yeah, bro, sorry, you lost me. I'm out. You know, you've got a responsibility. Be organized. Be there ready. Have the flyers ready. Have a plan. Have a map. Have a strategy. You know, if you want people to help you, make it easy for them to help you. Cool? All right. Now, now... Since I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm in the generous mode. I'm throwing out free stuff. I'll throw out some more free stuff. <laughs> Somewhere along the lines, we got a weird idea that if you have impact teams come for you, you're supposed to feed them. That's not true. You do not feed the impact team. If you want to, fine, but you don't have to. I want you to think about this from a practical perspective. Look at us. Look at us. What? I, I'm going to guess... 550, maybe 600 people here. You, you realize we all live in the same region. 
we could all go on the same impact team. Wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, come on, somebody. Someone's just got to organize it, right? What if it's a pioneer church and 600 of us show up? Where's the verse? Because, let's be honest for a minute, that is why some of you go on impact teams. And you can't even button your coat anymore because you've been on so many impact teams. That's not how it works. If the hosting church decides they want to feed the impact team, wonderful, but they're not obligated to. Give our pioneer churches a break. You know what? You are going to eat on Saturday anyway. Bring your own lunch. Hallelujah. But listen, this is actually a deeply spiritual issue. Our willingness and our effectiveness in co-laboring is, at its core, an issue of spirit and heart. That's what Moses recognized. He didn't want the wrong spirit to get loose. Numbers 32, 7, why will you discourage the heart of your brethren? Listen, this is a spiritual issue. Beyond that, it's the issue of building up, right? We build one another up. Paul said each uh, is a member of the body for edification. Peter talked about us being built together, a spiritual house. So this is the question that we answer anytime we talk about an impact team the question really is what does fellowship mean to you do you as a pastor really have the confidence that you could get an impact team anytime that if you called your brothers you'd get meaningful help do you as a pastor push this in your congregation that when there's a need we're going to respond we're going to invest and help our brethren this has to be deposited in your congregation. Will they sign up when you announce an impact team? Will they respond? Will they labor when they go? Ultimately, these things flow out of the heart. They have to be inside of you. You have to cultivate that in your heart. If you're a pastor, you have to cultivate this in your congregation. A spirit that genuinely cares about prays for and labors for our brethren so let's talk then finally about the power of gospel partners there is a blessing of multiplied effectiveness in our scripture this would have been easy to see when the two and a half tribes when the men said we will go out armed this would have been tens of thousands of armed men going to battle you can't miss that it would have been very obvious but the point is, is that they multiplied the effectiveness of their brethren, right? When we talk about impact teams, as I mentioned, we used to call it guerrilla teams, right? And, and you know, if you have as much education as me, I'm going to help you out. It's not G-O-R, you know, if it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey, it's a name. No, not like that. G-U-E, guerrilla, like guerrilla warfare. It literally means door-to-door -door warfare, going in the streets. That's what we used to call them. But see, that's the point is we can multiply our effectiveness. Maybe you're pioneering. You've got a handful of people, right? We can bring, listen, the Eldos Church could drop 100 people on your doorstep to outreach. It's multiplied effectiveness. That's the point. There's a great power in that. We will always be more effective when we are all working together toward the same goal. And I don't mean just once a year you have your token revival and so you call for your token impact team. It needs to be a spirit and an atmosphere of partnership. When I was in India, we pioneered a church in Bangalore, India, and there was a season when we weren't able to outreach. There was some legal opposition, some drama. It's a long story. But as Americans, it was still very, we could safely be on the street and talk to people. We just couldn't be obviously outreaching. So there was two other missionaries there. There was me, uh, Pastor Jesse Cluck, Pastor Louis Lobato. We're all in the same city. 
And so for a while, we made an agreement. What we're going to do is the three of us are going to get together and outreach together. We would go into my part of the city and outreach there and then go have lunch. Then the next week, we would go over to Jesse's or Louie's. And you know what? These were not amazing outreaches, right? It's not like the three of us went and the fire from heaven fell. No, we just, we got together, we partnered together, and we labored for our brothers. And we did this. You know what? That season passed, life went on. You know what's interesting is if you go back there today, those three churches, every single one of them is a thriving church planting church today. I don't believe it's a mistake. There was something deposited in those churches in the early day. Listen, for everyone in our fellowship, it doesn't matter the size of your church, we are blessed when we get help and we are blessed when we send help, right? And listen, if you've got a little church, you need to send impact teams to you. I don't care if it's two people. If it's just you and your wife and your kids, you need to send impact teams. It works the same as with money. This is what you preach, right? Listen, if you want to be able to give a lot of money, you've got to start by giving the little bit that you have now. If one day you want to send an impact team of 50 or 100 people, you've got to start with sending what you've got now. God will honor that. If you'll invest what you have, God will multiply it. Then we see there's the blessing of cross-pollination. One of the mistakes that I see happening with impact teams is that when there's an impact team, they all stay segregated. Come on, South Africa. You ought to know by now that's not okay. But, well, I've seen it here. The taxis pull up, right? We got, you know, this is, you know, bus A, bus B, bus C, and everyone gets out and you stand around your taxi. All right. And as soon as they tell us, well, we're getting back in, all of us, we get... And it's just you with your own people again. That's not okay. I have, for years, I, I always tell our outreach directors, you need to try as hard as you can to separate people. Mix them all up. Get, all right, take, if you've got 50 people from this church, say, okay, I want 10 of you. I want you to go with these people. And I want five of you to go over. Mix them all up. That is what makes our fellowship so great is that our people build relationships with people in other churches. We learn things. Maybe you learn a different way of witnessing. Maybe you meet someone. Hey, maybe they'll meet their wife. You never know. Unless she's from Eldos, that's not okay. <laughs> But listen, the, the, the benefits of cross-pollination with our churches, they far uh, exceed anything you could imagine. And I'll just throw this out there. If you are concerned about your people mingling with other people in the fellowship, you've got a problem. It's probably because you're worried your people are going to figure out what the fellowship is really like. And then they'll look at you going, Pastor, what's up with you? I instruct our outreach directors, when we have impact teams, split them up. I want the widest possible exposure in both directions. I want our people exposed to your people. I want your people to be exposed and build relationships with people in our church. I want the spirit of revival in my church to get into your church. And what our scripture shows us is that there is a supernatural blessing of God when we partner together. Verses 7 and 8, if you're not really paying attention, you'll actually miss what is being said here. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them saying, Return with much riches to your tents, very much livestock, silver, gold, bronze, iron, very much clothing. See, Pastor Rian, the clothing showed up again. <laughs> Divide the spoil of the enemies with your brethren. Now remember... These two and a half tribes had already inherited the land. They already had their inheritance. Everything that God had, they already had it, had it. But then when they went to fight for their brethren, God blessed them with riches on top of that. I'm going to tell you, that's the spirit that we want to unleash in our churches. God may be blessing you wonderful, but when you go and invest in other churches, when you go and labor, for, there's an additional blessing. God will pour things out in your congregation. Sometimes it's hard to fathom how God can bless you so much, but this is the wonderful promise, is that God will multiply 
his blessing on those that will truly be partners. Our very first church, as I mentioned, was in Las Vegas, Nevada. And there was a, a point in time when I was there, one of my close friends was also pioneering there, uh, Jeremiah Sawyer. Many of you knew him as a kid. He was pastoring there at that time. And um, one week, it would have been Monday or Tuesday in prayer, I really felt heavy. God was challenging me, you need to take an impact team for Jeremiah. Now, we were pioneering. We had a small church. At that time, it was our three older kids. The, the other two hadn't been imagined yet. And so it's me, Rachel, the three kids. And on outreach, sometimes there'd be two other people or three or four, you know. Like when we had outreach, it wasn't like a big deal. I mean, you know how it is when you're pioneering. Outreach is, sometimes outreach is like, hey, kids, let's get ice cream at the park. And that's all that's happening. And so I felt like God's saying, you need to call and offer to do an impact team for him. I want to be honest with you. I felt dumb. Like, because, you know, think about that call. Hey, bro, I want to bring an impact team. Yeah, yeah, me and my wife. My kids will probably be there. And I don't know if anyone else is coming, right? That just, it feels dumb. It, it feels, I was embarrassed, right? I, I just felt embarrassed. And, and so I just kind of brushed it off, went to work. Then the next day in prayer, it was even heavier. Like, you need to call and offer to do an impact team. Okay, fine. So I come and say, hey, uh, what are you doing Saturday? Do you have outreach? That's a dumb question, right? <laughs> yeah, I said, hey, I, I want to come over. We'll do an impact team for you. And, and he's like, uh, okay. You know, because he knew what I meant. That was going to be like me and my wife, right? <laughs> so we went over there. And you know, you know when God challenges you to do something, you're waiting for it to like, to be a big deal, right? I mean, you're like, okay. So we go over and like, all right, this would be awesome, man. We go out and... It's just a totally normal outreach. I don't, it's been too many years ago. I don't know if I prayed with anyone. I have no idea. It was just like one of those, you know, we went out to lunch afterward. Or I had ice cream or something. I have no idea. You can tell it made a huge impact on me. And I remember going home that afternoon just thinking, that was the weirdest thing. Like, like God, you told me to do this. I was expecting like the heavens to open or something. And nothing. It's like, no answer from God. Okay, whatever. So, we go to church Sunday morning. It's the usual pioneer thing. I'm playing guitar, leading songs. There is power, power. Hey, shut up and sit down. I'm going to spank your butt, you know. <laughs> the working power in the blood of the land. There is power. And the way our church was set up, it was a glass wall behind, like, you know, where I could see. But it was all covered with curtains. And I see a shadow. And I see a lady walk in, a visitor. I was like, praise God. There's a visitor in church this morning. And she had 13 children. Yo, come on. I was like, see it again. There is power, power. And so I'm just, you know, pastors, you ever try to count at times when you shouldn't be counting? That was 13 in the nail. And I, I'm going to tell you, I was just mind blown. Now, I know some people, some of you are more spiritual than me, and God talks to you all the time. Honestly, in my whole life, the times that I can say that I have heard the voice of God has been so few, maybe two or three times in my whole life. And this is one of them. As I watch that family and our ushers are freaking out, trying to find places for them to sit, I just heard the voice of God whisper to me, I will build my church. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what God's trying to teach you tonight. There's men here, I'm talking about canceling your outreach for a Saturday and take a whole day, go do an impact team. And you're thinking, Pastor, I'm, I am struggling. I, I'm barely making it, right? We, we, we rarely have a visitor. You know what? I bet there's some people live near you that have 13 kids. And probably that's on the low side, let's be honest. And God could just bring them right on in. Because this is what partnership means. This is the truth about investing in your brother's ministry. All boats rise on the same tide. Not only will God bless your church when you go partner for them, but you know what? When you build your brother's church, it's bigger 
and he can help you more. And then your church is bigger and you can help him more. And if we would all do that, could you imagine? Let's bow our heads together for a moment. Hallelujah. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. No one's moving around or looking around just for a few moments. What a wonderful spirit of God is here tonight. In a moment, I'm going to change the service, but first, quickly, if you are not a born-again Christian, you really need to be. The Bible says that we have all sinned, we all come short of God's glory. None of us are righteous. The consequence for your sin is hell. You will die one day and you'll stand before God. And if you are still stained by your sin, you will be condemned to a devil's hell for eternity. Religion won't fix that. Education can't fix that. Going to church is nice, but it doesn't change the fact of the matter that you are stained by sin and you need Jesus Christ to forgive you. Thank God Jesus came and he died for our sin. He shed his blood for you and I. Rose again from the dead that if you would turn from your sin, ask Jesus to forgive you. Scripture promises he'll forgive your sin. He'll wash away the stain of guilt and he gives the promise of eternal life with him in heaven. All you have to do is ask. Right now, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you would be honest tonight. You'd admit, that's me. I'm not a born-again Christian. Or maybe you're a backslider. You want to give your life to Jesus. If that's you, put your hand up and hold it there for a moment so I can see it. Praise God. I see this one. How many more? Join these honest hearts. Praise God. I see that hand. How many more would there be? Join these. God's here. He wants to meet with you. Your life can be changed. Praise God. I see that one and that one. How many more would there be? Join these hearts. Praise God. I see this one. There's others. Unsaved or backslidden. Lift your hand. God wants to meet with you. Your life can be changed. Up in the balcony, if that's you, unsaved or backslidden, you want to give your life to Jesus, just put your hand up. God wants to meet you here. Hallelujah. Thank God. Every one of you that lifted your hand, I want you to get up out of your seat. Come down. Kneel down here in the front. You lifted your hand. Come kneel down. Up on top. Come down over on this side. You lifted your hand. Why don't you come? Someone's going to come pray with each of these. Just kneel down anywhere here in the front is fine. Someone's going to pray with you. Lead them in a prayer of repentance. If you didn't lift your hand, but you know you needed to, this is your time. Get up out of your seat. Come, kneel down. Someone will pray with you. Your life will never be the same. Praise God. Hallelujah. If I could have one more man come pray right here. Thank you, Jesus. Another man to pray here. Hallelujah. Thank God. There's others coming. If God's dealing with you, just respond. I gave my life to Jesus in 1996. God changed and transformed my life. He can do the same for you right now. Just slip out of your seat. Come kneel down. Someone will pray with you. Hallelujah. Thank God. I need some more workers to come pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Then Christians... I preach very clear tonight, very simple. This is not a complicated message. But I believe God is dealing with people. He's challenging people about this issue. I want to invite you to come pray. Let's stand together. This altar is open. Come, make a way, find some room to pray. Hallelujah. You get out of your seat. Come pray. Make room in the aisles. If there's no room, turn around in your seat and pray. But don't just sit there. You need to get down and pray. Talk to God about this issue. Hallelujah. We'll sing a song while these are praying. Wonderful Jesus. We need you to breathe upon us. God, breathe upon your people. Cause there to be a quickening of the Holy Ghost. and in your favor, Lord. 
God, breathe upon your people. Help and minister tonight. Give a revelation of partnership. I'm asking you to give inspiration. Give creativity and ideas. Stir your people for your purposes, God. For the work of the kingdom, Lord. Sing it out, amazing grace. together. Thank you, Jesus. Sharananda Rabba Kararaba Sidurubu Sarananda Rabba Basha. Wonderful God. Sharananda Rabba Sidiorubu Korobu Sai. Sharanada Rabba Korobu Siti Araba Korobu Sidurubu Sai. Let's worship God together. Thank you, Jesus. Shadarananda Rabba Bakuru Mundu Rubu Sidiya Rabba Bakarananda Rabba Basa. Lidia Rabba Kurubu Sukurubu Sarananda Rabba Bakuru Mundu Sarabasa. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God. What a wonderful God we serve. Can you say amen? In a moment, we're going to be dismissed. Remember, tomorrow, uh, pastors only, you're invited. Just an open question and answer session. That'll be in classroom one upstairs at 7 a.m. You can come a little before that. There'll be coffee ready. 7.30, prayer begins. 8.30, the preaching begins. We have some powerful preaching tomorrow. Please, uh, when you come at 7.30, let's pray. It is very difficult when you're trying to pray and people are laughing and talking if you want to save a seat and then go outside, that's fine. But in here, let's pray. We're going to get a hold of God. 7.30 prayer begins, preaching at 8.30. Be safe as you go tonight. Amen. You can be dismissed.